Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome all our online students. Thank you for uh, joining class. Uh, welcome to our in-person students and also to our e-learning students who will be listening to this lecture um, later on. Good morning, Lucy. Uh, we'll begin with a word of prayer, and I'll ask Deeksha to lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for this day that you gave us new morning and love. Thank you that you gathered us again for learn your word. And thank you, Lord. I give to Senator Mem in your hand, Lord. Give your knowledge, give your wisdom so she could teach us your word properly. And Lord, give us also all students your knowledge and wisdom, Lord. We could learn, uh, we could learn your word properly and we could share to others this word properly. A lot, all glory, all honor I submitted in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Diksha. Okay. So uh, last Friday, we began studying our third publication for this uh, uh, course, Minister's Foundation. We began studying uh, from the book um, Code of Honor. Uh, we looked at um, chapter one, which is talking about our personal life. So this book basically is very uh, more practical. Uh, is talking about how we as ministers of God, how we need to conduct our lives, how we need to live our lives, um, conduct our ministry, handle our family, and all other aspects and areas of our life and ministry. So it's more practical. And um, pra Pastor is basically, Pastor Ashish is writing this book. So he's sharing more from his personal life um, uh, experience on how to handle um, personal life, family, ministry, conduct, and every area of um, uh, related with our life and ministry, okay? So with that regard, we are looking at how as ministers of God, uh, we uh, have to conduct our own personal lives. So we looked at uh, a few aspects of it. Last week, we began, um, you know, talking about how we need to strengthen our character, how we need to uh, schedule daily time in the secret place, how we need to um, uh, practice and then teach how we need to keep our lifestyle simple and pure and honoring in God's sight and how we need to guard our motives. Okay. So today we'll begin uh, with um, the point that talks about how we need to um, uh, stay clean in all private sexual sins on page number 17. So those of you who are following the printed publication, it's on page number 17. Uh, the PDF copy, I don't know. I, I just need to check the, the, the subtitle is stay clean uh, of all private sexual um, sin. Okay, so Paul writing to the Corinth church at Corinth, he says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Um, and then he talks about how God will destroy, um, you know, uh, and also it says in that same uh, chapter, chapter 6, verse um 12, 13, 19, and 20, which is written in your book, talks about the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And it says, Paul says, don't you know your bodies are the temple of the living God? Okay. And uh, we, we are bought with a price. And so we need to glorify God with our bodies. Okay. So here we see that God designed our sexuality. Uh, but he has given us boundaries in which, or he has given, he has placed boundaries in which we need to express our sexuality. Now, as ministers of God or people in Bible uh, college or people who have enrolled in a Bible college, it does not mean that, you know, because we are full time in ministry or in Bible college or we are Christian ministers that we become angels, our sexual passions suddenly just disappear. And it's only for worldly people. No, uh, we also suffer or we also face these as challenges, temptations and weaknesses in our flesh. So it does not just disappear. So we need to talk about it. We need to acknowledge it and we need to address it and we need to take action for our 
um, selves. And uh, even though, you know, we want to, um, we uh, have this as a challenge, our sexual passions, you know, God's empowering grace is always with us. His word and the Holy Spirit enables us and helps us. Uh, even though sexuality uh, is a very um, private matter, you know, and we can be involved, some of us can be involved in lustful, uh, uh, filthy, dirty thoughts. We can also be indulged in pornography, looking at a lot of sexual content, which is freely available on internet, uh, you know, and we can compromise in these areas, lustful thinking, you know, just flirting with the opposite sex means, you know, you're just talking with, uh, 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 I, I can just flirt around with men means I can just talk to them, be nice to them, you know, do everything with men. You're just flirting and that's not God honoring, okay? Uh, and we think that, you know, those things can be covered because nobody sees that, but God sees it. And um, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 9, a little leaven, um, you know, leavens the whole lump. That means a little yeast is enough to make the full uh, dough or the atta that is there, which you want to make chapati or bread or dosa, idli. It's enough. Just a little yeast is enough to make it more, you know, soft and fluffy. And that's how you have your bread and all puffed up. Okay, so a little sin is enough to just spread and corrupt our entire bodies and our entire being, our soul, our spirit and our bodies. But God definitely sees it, even though it's hidden from others, God definitely sees it. And then he'll deal with it one way or the other. So before it comes out in the open and everybody knows about it, it's important for us to stay clean from all private sexual sins. So how do you handle your sexual passions? Pastor just gives a few things. What he does, he basically says when he travels, which he travels often, when he goes to the hotel room, he does not put on the TV, you know, because when you're alone, you can uh, you know, you can watch things, whether it's a movie, commercial, as anything, you know, that has sexual uh, content, which can corrupt our minds. And also he says when he looks at, you know, when he's driving or he looks at billboard signs or when he's looking at magazines or newspapers, you know, any content or even uh, on the when he's on the Internet browsing, anything like that, you know, um, things pop up, right? When we walk around, we see things. Um, when we look at magazines, newspapers, there's so much of sexual content. When we look at um, um, internet, things just pop up. But what he does is he does not give it a second look. He just turns away. Something that we all can do, we all can follow. And also if something just pops up, don't give it on the internet, on your screens. Uh, don't look at it. Don't give it a second view. Okay. And also um, talks about masturbation here. You know, um, there are different views on masturbation, uh, uh, whether it is um, in the in the church, the Christian community, or in the medical field. But Pastor mentions his point of view. He says that he does not want his body to be a slave to anything. Just like we read in First Corinthians chapter six, verse twelve, Paul says, "Everything is lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of." anything okay so masturbation some people can say it's okay some people you know have views against it but what pastor is saying here in his book is you know it can become very habitual once it becomes a habit you can be enslaved to it and it can become a bondage and it can become a sin so why come to a place where it can become a bondage can become a habit and become a, a sin and what else can we do to um deal with our sexual passions you know it's important that we make declarations even in this area of our life declare that your body is not for sin or for sexual immorality just like we read our bodies are the temple of the living god okay and god's holy spirit dwells in us so we need to confess or declare and decree that our body is not for sin, for sexual immorality, but it's for the Lord. And then also declare uh, that Jesus is Lord over your sexual desires and your passions. Very important. Okay. So don't feel ashamed. You can declare that Jesus is Lord over your sexual desires and your sexual passions. 
and and consecrate when you pray just consecrate your sexual parts of your being to god and declare that all of your sexual desires all of your sexual hungers and appetites are holy and consecrated to the lord because god has put it in us but satan can use it to you know uh, to deviate from its original purpose and intent and corrupt us corrupt our minds so we need to declare that and say that our sexual desires appetites our passions are holy and is consecrated to god okay the next one is we need to be accountable to god every moment you know um uh, second corinthians 5 verse 9 says Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. So our objective in life should be that our life should be well-pleasing to God. Okay. So moment by moment, we need to be accountable to God. You know, even now you're sitting here in this class, but your mind can be somewhere. It can be thinking some things which are negative, positive, good, bad, whatever. Okay. But you need to be, we are accountable to uh, God. And we need to live with this uh, uh, fact that one day we are going to stand before the judgment seat throne of God. Okay. We're going to stand before this awesome God and we are going to give an account of our life and that should actually motivate us to live our lives in in purity and holiness and in well pleasing to god if that is not going to motivate us to live a life pleasing and uh, honoring and holy unto the lord nothing will okay so we need to always keep this in mind always be mindful of this fact that one day we are going to stand before the judgment seat of god and we are going to give an account to god for everything that we have thought said done in whether in action or in uh, deed so whatever ministry we are doing god is watching over us he is watching us he knows our intents our motives he's following us okay and um, he sees beyond what people see okay people see the outward god looks at the heart he knows our motives okay so god is not interested in our mostly interested in our quality of our work but the motives with which we do what we do okay so it's not enough just we do good works good works is not going to take us to heaven but it's important also that when we do those good works our motives are pure and holy okay another thing that we need to consider in our personal life is that you know just like there are no part-time believers there are also no part-time ministers we are full-time believers we are full-time ministers of god okay so if you have a desire to um, serve god you're in the business field or in the marketplace you're serving god it does not mean that you just leave your jobs and go into full-time ministry okay so if god is calling you um, and you know for sure that he wants you to leave your job and go you can do that but you know till that time engage in the marketplace because everybody leaves the marketplace and goes to full-time ministry who is going to minister in the marketplace because there are so many people there in the uh, in the uh, in the world outside who need to know godly values ethics principles kingdom standards kingdom culture kingdom lifestyle so it's good that even if you have a calling and you are in the um, marketplace continue to work till you wait on god's clear directives and timing for you to move out of that place and engage into full-time ministry okay so till then you can serve the lord it's not unholy to uh, do ministry and to be in the market place uh, we know a, a, an example of paul paul was a what was his job he was a tent maker right he did his own business and that gave him more credibility for his being an apostle being a minister because he was not dependent on people nobody could point a finger at him he would take care of his own expenses and so it's not unholy for us to engage in the marketplace and do ministry at the uh, same time. Um, you know, if you are doing that also, you know, God will, uh, you know, pour out his gifting and his anointing and use us um, mightily. Okay. And the next thing is very important. We, we overlook it. You know, we think that um, 
our bodies are the temple of the living God. So we should not see anything that is unholy, say anything that's unholy, keep our motives pure, holy, keep ourselves free from sin. But some of us can, we don't exercise well. We don't sleep well. And we eat and eat and eat all kinds of things. And then we fall, uh, we are unhealthy, we are... Uh, you know, we are unwell. And so it's important that even as our bodies are the temple of the living God, not just to keep ourselves away from sin and keep ourselves pure, but also maintain a healthy lifestyle. Healthy lifestyle means exercising, sleeping at the right time, eating at the right time, maintaining a, 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 a timetable, a clock. Our body runs like, you know, uh, when you do things systematically, it uh, the body functions even more better. Okay, so if we don't do this, what happens? We are wasting a lot of our time and money running to hospitals for medical care, and um, also if we don't do this, you know, we don't have the energy and the health to serve God for a longer period of time. Okay, so stay healthy so that you can live a long life and you can serve God uh, all the days of your um, life. Okay, and the last thing is we need to have a personal management plan. Okay, uh, we need to, just like God works in times and seasons, he has a Kronos time, he has a Kairos time. Just as God works in times and seasons, we also and he has a plan which he has said before the foundations of the world. We also need to have a personal management plan. Okay. Look at what 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 4 says. Can somebody read that please? 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen. So here the word sound minds means a mind that is disciplined and self-controlled. Okay. The Holy Spirit fills us with boldness, power, discipline, love, and self-control. Okay. Um, and the Holy Spirit gives us the power to keep ourselves, our spirit, soul, and body under discipline and under self control. So one of the works of the Holy Spirit is that he keeps our mind, sorry, our soul, our spirit, our body in discipline, in self-control, uh, 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 and also in boldness, power, and love. Okay. So um, we need to have a plan so that we can be self-disciplined. You know, we need to uh, have an order or a a, a, a schedule that we follow in your life so that we can use the time and the resources that God has given to us well. If not, if we don't have a time or a management plan, we can get distracted. We can do a lot of unnecessary things. And, you know, distractions result in waste of time and energy. And that's why some, some of us say, hey, the whole day went away and I didn't do anything. Why? Because the beginning of the day, you have not planned your day or you say you know 20 years of my life 10 years of my life just went off like this how time flies away i didn't do anything in my life because we didn't have a personal management plan okay and also we know that when we don't have one we get distracted and we it distraction leads to delays delays in what god wants to fulfill in and through our lives and also weakens our uh, our drive to pursue God's plan and purpose for our lives. So um, having a personal management plan will help us to be disciplined and use the resources God has given to you. So what is a personal management plan you need to have? First thing is have a daily schedule. Like when you get up in the morning, you want to get up at 4, 4.30, 5, 5.30, whatever, spend this many hours or this much of time in prayer, then, you know, physical exercise, then, you know, your personal care, um, maybe you want to have breakfast with your family, then it's work, then you come back in the evening, what do you want to do in the evening? You know, you want to go grocery shopping with your spouse, so, you know, spend time with your children, teaching your children, you know, family time, uh, have dinner with your family. So it's good to have a personal management daily schedule plan. Also need to set your priorities right, okay? Who is first in our lives? God. Second, 
family third ministry okay so it's god family and then ministry but for some of us it can become god ministry and then family for some of us it can become ministry god family so some of us can also be ministry family and then god because we think always we're serving god so we think that god is first but we forget god has actually gone down the uh, priority list okay and also when uh, when we're doing ministry we need to know what we need to say yes to what we need to say no to okay say yes to things where your gifting your calling uh, your anointing can be released and can be used in a mighty way just don't uh say yes to anyone and everyone because you want to become popular or because you want to you know run around town or run around the country or run around the world okay or travel the world also don't say yes because when you travel and you preach in the sun you can get monetary benefits okay or you can become famous say yes to uh, ministry assignments which help you in your specific gifts and anointing uh, that god has given you so that it can be used for the extension and the building of his kingdom okay also pastor here mentions about meeting church people he's talking about this in the context of um, a pastor so if you are going to be into pastor ministry this can help those of you who are already in pastor ministry can help you he says when people want to meet him you know he doesn't go to meet them he calls them to the office so that when uh, when he calls them to the office he knows that they have something very important to talk to something uh, very major that they want to discuss is not something that's very simple that can be just shared over the phone or on a whatsapp message or at church so he asked them to come so that it saves his time and energy and he's able to meet and help more people so this is something that we can also follow and he does not take a lot of um, you know um, invitations for birthdays and special occasions depends you know where how special the occasion is because he says he can't be there at all places doing all things at all times and getting tired just to do what is more practical and what god has called him okay another thing we need to remember as ministers of god is that you know when we are in a ministry we feel so obligated that we need to help anyone and everyone who comes to us with their needs their problems with their sorrows and sometimes some of us are so sensitive that we can get carried away with people's sufferings and to the extent that it is going to um you know turn us into a patient or you know turn us to a place where we are losing our patience our peace of mind so we pastor says we need to remember that we are not god we can't help anyone and everyone in any and every situations but then who do we help he says he helps only those people you know he uh, where he feels god makes him responsible for those people or you know he stirs up his heart to respond to them and uh, he and god prompts him to do something to help and uh, he you know goes ahead and does that so we can't help everyone around okay because we are not god uh, so we need to see who we can help what we can uh, do okay and the last thing is um, you know have a life plan he has a 10 year life plan but each one of us can begin with at least a one year life plan maybe now we are end of 2023 you can think what you want to do in 2024 what you are want to accomplish or you can have a life plan for 2 years 3 years 5 years some of you want to think 10 years down the line is good so that's what he does he does a 10 year plan he writes down everything he wants to do in the next 10 years and he says he has seen god work through so like we learned in um, i think in receiving god's guidance or in fulfilling god's purpose you know just uh, write down your plans say god this is my plan have the holy spirit to move and be ready and willing to you know even as the holy spirit or god leads us and guides us in different ways makes changes in our plans but it's good to plan uh, our lives so that we are not just not idle not doing anything and and looking back and saying that we have wasted our lives okay so as ministers of god um each one of us whether we are in full time ministry or whether we are in the marketplace we are all called a royal priesthood we are all given a great commission matthew chapter 28 
uh, to go and preach and teach and baptize. So we are all, whether we like it or not, called to be in ministry. And so here are some of important things that we need to look at uh, even as we conduct our personal lives. Okay. Any questions? Any questions on chapter one? Okay, if there are no questions, we'll move on to chapter two about family, okay? Um, First Timothy chapter three, verses four and five says, a Christian minister must be one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. If a man does not know how to rule his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? So what is very important even as we do ministry is more important is how we conduct our own personal lives, how we are before God, because our personal lives, our time that we spend in secret is an overflow. Our ministry is an overflow of our intimacy with God in the secret place. Okay, It's where we get refueled, recharged, empowered, anointed so that we can go out and minister in the same way. If a minister of God cannot handle his own family and his children, you know, how can he take care of the house of God? Okay. So family is very, very important. And many times, uh, many in Christian ministry are not able to balance family and ministry. They're so busy doing ministry that their family suffers. And that's why we see that the spouse leaves them and goes away with someone else. Very sad. And their children become very rebellious and go away from God. Okay. So even as Christian ministers are busy counseling others, other marriages, other families, other children, their own families sometimes are struggling um, and are in a point of breakdown. Okay. So it's very important that a minister uh, takes care of his family first and then, you know, um, ministry. Okay. So we look at various aspects of how we in ministry need to take care of our family. So some of you are thinking here, I'm not married, but it doesn't matter. We have our, um, you know, our, our parents, our siblings, we'll be married, we'll be married soon any day, you know, so it's all good life lessons that you can learn. Okay. Now people say that in the scripture that there are three postures or three positions that one can take in their life. The first posture is what um, uh, Luke chapter 14 verse 26 says that the Lord Jesus said, if we don't hate our wife and children, we cannot be his disciple. Okay. So that is the one stand that people take. That it says if you're in ministry, we need to hate our wife and children. So the second stand is in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verses 29 to 35, where the Lord instructs through Apostle Paul, that those who are married should live as though they are not married. They should not be distracted with their spouse. Okay. And the third posture is people point out to 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 2 and uh, 2 to 5, where the Lord instructs us again through Paul that spiritual leaders must take care of their wives and children and have their home in proper order. Okay. So some people, you know, think that we at different points in life, they have to take different postures, a different stand. So they say, you know, we need to decide uh, to hate our family, totally hate our wife and children and give ourselves fully to the Lord's ministry. Some others think that we need to, you know, uh, be married and live as though we are not married. Okay, that means don't uh, involve yourself in any of the marital affairs or relationships or anything that has to do with your marriage. And then there are the, another group of people who think that they should take the stand where they are constantly, you know, engaging in their relationship with their wife and children and taking care of their home and their family. Okay. So people say we can take one of these different stands or postures. Okay. But that is not correct. That is not right. 
we need to fulfill all of these three postures simultaneously or we need to take all of these three stands simultaneously at all times in our life which uh, you know which means that if you're married and you have children your love for god should be supersede or should be more than your love for your wife and your children or for your earthly relationships which means when god calls you for full time ministry you must be willing to you know uh, not leave your wife and children or your family but you know your love for god should supersede your love for your family it does not mean that you don't take responsibility for your family for your parents for your spouse and for your children but it just means that when the lord calls you you must be willing to make sacrifices okay sacrifices means that you must be willing to give up some things to take on the call the second thing is you know even if you're married uh, you know, while fulfilling your family responsibilities, you must not be distracted, but also focus on ministering to the Lord and pleasing him above all else. Okay. And thirdly, we need to do our part in growing and nurturing our families in a way that God will be glorified. So now you're saying, how can we draw the balance, right? How can I um you know at one point in time you're saying i have to take care of my family i have to love them i have to meet their needs and at the same time you're saying that the love of god should supersede earthly relationships and you are also saying that you know we need to grow and nurture our family in a way that god will be glorified how do we balance it okay so now the holy spirit is our counselor our teacher our guide, our helper, he's a parakletos, he's someone who comes alongside of us, and so he will help us. He's there to help us to balance ministry and family. When to say yes to family, when to say yes to ministry, when to blend the two, when to do what we need to do. And I'm sure the Holy Spirit will help us and guide us because he is our helper, he is our counselor, and he is our um, guide okay another thing we need to keep in mind with family is we need to nurture our relationship with our spouse you know sometimes being in ministry we are so caught up with ministering to people that we think that god will take care of our spouse and our children okay and we think that you know they are they will take care of their own needs we are taking care of god's family God's church, God will take care of my own family, okay? No, it's not that. God has put us in a place of responsibility, right? As men of the house, you are the head of the house. You have to take care of your wife and your children. As, as wives, as women, we need to take care of the husband and the uh, children. We just can't keep running around doing ministry and saying God will take care of our spouse and our children. That's wrong. Okay, so it's our responsibility to nurture and cherish our spouse. Okay, just like we take time and care and um, show affection to people we minister to, we also need to take that kind of time and care and show affection to our spouse and to our um, children. Okay, um, and we need to care for both. Okay, we also need to nurture our relationship with our children sometimes those who are in ministry think that you know the responsibility of uh, bringing up children is the lord or it's it belongs to the church so some pastors think that you know i'm taking care of the church the church will take care of my children or the sunday school teachers will take care of my uh, children or the lord himself will take care of the children or my wife is there she will nurture and take care of the children and so many ministers of god they just abandon their children and that's why we see sadly that many missionary and uh, you know children or ministers of god you know their children become very rebellious they don't want to do anything with god because their parents haven't given time or um, you know spent time with them giving them that kind of love and affection and they look for love and affection in the wrong place and they are misled okay so uh, it's a responsibility of parents to train up the children um, in the Lord, as we see in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children, but bring them up, training them in the admonition of the Lord. 
Okay, so we need, to need, we need to take the responsibility to train up our children in the way of the Lord and tell them what to do. Okay, how do we do that? We need to build a relationship with children. Sometimes as parents, we can uh, just be ordering them. Don't do this. Don't do that. I'm telling you. Why should, whether parents, the children ask, why can't I do it? Because I am telling you it. Because the word of God says. Because God says. And that's why they get more angry. Okay. So what? how do we train our children is when we build a relationship with them. When we develop a relationship with our children, which means we know what they like, we are interested in them, in their um, in their uh, plans, in their uh, um, in what they are interested in, what they like to talk about. We talk about what they like to talk. We go where they want to go, you know. Meet their friends uh, if they like painting. Just spend time with them painting, you know. Building a relationship with them, and when we do that, you know. Uh, we uh, can we are better able to speak into their lives because when we tell them they'll think hey no my parents are genuinely interested in me they're not just telling me what to do and what not to do but they're generally interested in my life so it's important that we do that okay and um, not delegate our responsibility of nurturing our children to someone um, else but there is no greater joy you know, then seeing our children walk in the ways of the Lord and fulfilling God's best for them. Okay. The other thing is we need to work to provide for our family. It's sad that sometimes, you know, um, when people are called into full-time ministry, ministers of God, they lack the funds and the resources or the money to take care of their wives and th their wife, not wives, their wife and their children. Okay. And uh, because of that, their wife and children suffer so if you're not getting enough income from your ministry it's okay for you to take a job for some time till the basic needs of your family are met and it's not a sin to do that because it's god's word tells us god's word tells us that he desires a man of the house to uh, to provide for his family look at what first timothy chapter 5 verse 8 says can somebody read that please First Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. But another point, pro work to provide for your family. Can somebody read that, please? But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So here what it says, if, does, if someone does not provide for his own family, especially his own household, what happens? He has denied his faith. Can you imagine? And he's worse than whom? Unbeliever. Okay. So it's important that we don't just wash off our hands and say, I'm going to serve God. You take care of yourselves. Okay. It's important that we take care of our family so it's okay if you do a job it's not a sin because God's word tells us we need to take care of our family once financially there is some good support some good income then you can look into going into you know totally submitting your time or dedicating your time to full-time ministry okay the next one is pursue God's purpose as an individual you know um um, it's important that even as we take care of our family and our home, we do not compromise on our love for God and the obedience to God's calling. Okay, so uh, important thing here is your call as a wife, a husband, as a father, as a mother is also interlinked with your role as a minister of God, whatever ministry you are doing and um, you know so your every role that is part of you is interlinked and each role actually strengthens the other role so if you are uh, good as a father as a wife as a, a, a as a husband then that is going to support your role in the ministry that is going to support your role as, uh, if you're a good husband, it's going to support your role as being a good father. It's going to support your role as being a good minister of God. So the roles that we have are all interlinked and each role strengthens the other roles. So if you're not a good husband, you can't be a good father. You can also not be a good minister of 
God. Okay, so it's important that you know when you have success in one area, it also will provide success in all different areas of your life. Okay, so you have a, a, a good relationship with God the Father, you will have a good relationship with your earthly father, with your siblings, with your wife, with your children. Okay, the next thing is also encourage your spouse to pursue God's purpose sometimes we think that you know because we are in full time ministry that you know um, our wives should be uh, people who are supporting us our children also should support us okay that's not uh, right it's not that our wives should just come along just pray or you know they should just um, be like um, um, uh, you know, prayer leaders or Sunday school uh, leaders in the church, uh, supporting your ministry, traveling along with you. But if they have a separate calling and purpose, they can pursue what God has called them and what calling and purpose God has for them. Okay. So look at what Psalms chapter 128 verse 3 says. Can somebody read that please? Psalm 128 verse 3. Psalm 128 verse 3. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house, your children like olive plants all around your table. Amen. So fruitful wine here symbolizes several things, but one thing it symbolizes here is the fruit of the wine which stands for joy and pleasure. Okay. Your spouse, your wife can be a source of joy and pleasure and this will not happen automatically she will be a joy and pleasure to you when you take the time to nurture your wife and encourage her to find out what is her calling what is her purpose that god has for her life what she feels satisfied doing what she finds fulfillment doing and get her to do that and encourage her to do that if not your wife will become sour grapes okay so sour grapes you know does not bring any joy and there's no pleasure there is constant friction there's constant strife and there is um, things will not be easy okay so it's important that you know um, uh, you identify uh, what is the calling and the purpose your wife has and encourage and, um, you know, help her to pursue her calling in her um, life. Sometimes if she has a calling for full-time ministry, husband and wife is great. No problem. Both of you can serve the Lord together. But if not, you need to encourage and help her to fulfill her calling and um, uh, her purpose that God has for your life in the same way we also need to encourage our children to pursue god's calling and purpose for their lives now because you are in full-time ministry you are a pastor and you have a son and um, you've started a church it does not mean that it becomes like a family business you want your son to take on the church and continue the family business it's not like that god might have a different calling for your son or for your daughter and you need to nurture what is their calling sometimes as um, as individuals as parents we have unfulfilled dreams you wanted to become a doctor an engineer a teacher or a chef or a pilot and you're not able to do it so what do you do you want your dreams to be lived out through your children and so you force them to do what you were not able to do and it's very very sad right i know of many young people you know their their parents have forced them to go to medical school to be engineers they're so frightened just to see blood to see dead bodies you know they just can't finish their medical course and they're wasting their money or they're depressed they're so suicidal i know of many young people whose parents just wanted to become an engineer and um, that person wanted to actually become a veterinary doctor loves animals so the parents thought, you know, it's not going to become, get good income. So forced that, that uh, boy into engineering school. And he, engineering takes how many years? Four years. He was six years. He had not yet finished his engineering. He was struggling. Why? Because he was not interested. But he said, I'll just finish my engineering. Just give my certificate to my father. And then I will go and do what I want to do. And there are some children who have done that. 
They've just done their engineering. They've gone and tell, told their parents, here, take this certificate. You wanted me to be an engineer. I'm an engineer. Now I'll do what I want to pursue in life. And it's sad. So don't live out your dreams through your children. They have a calling. You know, they are not, um, God has not made them duplicates. Just like you, they have the, God has not made them. They're different. God has a different calling and purpose. Help them to identify God's calling and purpose and to pursue that. Okay. Another thing we need to be care, um, mindful of as ministers of God when we are living in the context of a family that we need to set a godly example at home. Okay. Uh, look at what First Timothy chapter three verse five says. Can somebody read that, please? First Timothy chapter three verse five. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house. How will he take care of the church of God? Thank you. So we know we know that our life, um, you know, in our homes is noticed. We can be an I can be an angel outside. I can be very anointed, very spiritual. Everyone thinks that I'm a very holy person. But it's only the my family members at home can tell me whether I'm really an angel or a devil or in between somewhere, right? Okay, because they are watching our lives, our conduct very, very closely. And uh, look at what God tells uh, about Abraham in Genesis chapter 18, verse 9. Can somebody else read it, please? Genesis chapter 18, verse 9. Can you read it, please? Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. We are under the point set the godly example at home. Yes. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Paramita. Genesis uh, chapter 18, verse 19. For I have chosen him so that he would direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. So that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Amen. Thank you, Paramita. So here we see that when God called Abraham, one of the reasons why he called him was because he knew that he would order his uh, children and his household up after him to keep the commandments or the ways of the Lord. So God wanted the man he chose to lead his household after him. So can you imagine why God chose Abraham? Because he knew that Abraham was somebody who would command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. So we see that Abraham's calling and destiny is closely tied up with his role that he was to fulfill. Okay. So... You know, it's very important that, um, you know, uh, that we uh, conduct our lives in a way that when, when our family members look at us, they would want to pursue God because of the way they are looking at our own lives as ministers of God. Our children would want to read the Bible, pray, and to live holy lives because they're seeing that in us as parents or us as people in the family uh, and not because we are forcing them with words or not because we are pushing the bible into them or not because we're telling them hey the bible says this we need to do this but they're just observing our lives and they're just following it and they're pursuing god uh, not because of the words that we are forcing on them okay but because the kind of life that we are living and they would want to just follow our lifestyle just looking at us and that's a lifestyle that we can lead them to live honoring and pleasing to god okay so that is very very important we have just one more minute anyone has any questions before we go for our break and then we can come back and continue any more any questions No questions? Online students, anyone has any questions? OK, if there are no questions, uh, we'll take a break, and then we'll come back after the break and start. <laughs> 